Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, on the, on the plus side, I do, do want to give, I do want to give a little bit of a a shout out to people who've, who've reached out to us at the moment. Um, I, a few people have just been sending us really nice messages, and uh, someone got got in touch recently. Um, I won't mention any names, but uh, just said uh, you know helping with the sanity and uh, maintaining morality throughout uh, this lockdown p- period. And uh, she's only feckin' delira to hear that we're doing more stories. So thanks, Lucy. Um, we're also going to be doing um, a bit of a shout out for people who've giving us a bit of support and pat uh, on our Patreon page because that's helping a lot, guys. Honestly, we're able to get the Zoom mics to put these live recordings up because people are supporting us on Patreon. So that's class. So thank you all for reaching out, commenting, and sending us a book, you legend. Um, Someone gave me a book. Hang on, I'll go get the book. book. <laughs> uh, you will talk in one second. Uh, I'm going to turn Aaron up. Aaron's audio is actually coming through my laptop, so he's going to be a little bit quieter than me, unfortunately, on this live stream. Uh, apologies for that. Hopefully he's recording at his end, though. I literally just start recorded, started recording this on this end. Whoops. There's a lot going on. My head is Whoops. not right. Um... I'll give a shout out to uh, the lad who sent us a book um, when I find the book and I'll post it on our stories. Thank you. Uh, that was very kind. Um, anyway, we're back. We're in the room and I hope you are sitting down with a nice cup of tea and you're enjoying yourself on this fine Saturday. So, Saraka, we have been delving into stories about the Fianna. We've been talking about uh, Dear and Grania part one or the first bit of that story I guess last week and I it's kind of interesting to be go- looking at the Fianna now in terms of well it's spring I always feel like springtime feels like Fianna time and I think you do too because it's it's what we tend to lean towards and it's the time for kind of rebirth re-looking at stuff and yeah um, they had the crack in the summer Um <laughs> I'm get, just getting a message from someone. Is it on yet? They tune in at one promptly. Um, uh, you talk there one second. I can... <laughs> uh, this window won't open. Um, is there any way of muting the bings? <laughs> Took me time <laughs> to find yes. it. Hi, Celia. Glad you could join us. We're only getting started. You didn't miss much except us faffing about and trying to figure out if like, microphones were working because live streaming is hard and um, yeah, it, live streaming is hard. <laughs> it shouldn't be that hard. It was actually, to be fair, it was the connecting the multiple videos the one time was a little bit tricky thing. So we'll sort that out. We'll sort that out. It's all good. It's all good. Now that we have this and Oshin helping us. And the old turn off and turn on again trick. That always works, isn't it? Isn't it? It's God, literally what we did. Crowd 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 literally, literally what we did. Nothing was working um, for a half an hour. And we tried many things. And then we turned it off and turned it on things. again. Turn it off, turn it on again. So, all right. I want to ask you, Zorica, uh, why, why do you think this time of year, maybe even just personally, why do you think this time of year feels like Fianna time? Um... There's a couple of things. Uh, it's partly in like as a reflection and as a as a a response to the Ulster cycle, which is a winter story. And uh, there's some thing that I read somewhere, can't remember where, about the town like traditionally being told in winter after dark because it's a very dark half kind of cycle. And I really liked that. It really appealed to me and. Um, I think there's there's a definite possibility that that's how people used to tell the stories of Irish mythology when they were the mythology, uh, was that they were kind of seasonally linked. But as with a lot of stuff like that, we don't really know for certain uh, how people use them or how people told them. So, but I liked the idea of doing that and doing it as much as possible. And when you look at the Fianna stories, they were supposed to have lived in the houses of kings in the winter, in the dark half of the year. And 
lived out in the open um, and had their adventures in the light half of the year. So that's why I think, you know, coming up to Bealtaine, which was the time when they went out again, um, from Bealtaine to Samhain was like, in my mind now, that has become the time of the Fianna. Because it's the time when they like sure. go out and do their adventures. And then also because um, because of the St. Patrick connection with Patrick's Day. Uh, obviously, that's that's a good bit ahead of Bealtaine. But like, I think that kind of starts us all thinking Fianna from like March uh, and, and kind of looking at Fianna stories. Um, so, yeah, those are kind of three reasons why I associate this time of year with Vienna. <laughs> no, it's totally like it, it makes perfect sense in terms of the narrative of the Fianna, how they're always outside, they're foraging, they're hunting, they're part of the land, they're ingrained in the land as well. And I think even like metaphorically, the Fianna can represent a resurgence into life and into kind of experiencing life. And when we come out of the dark half of the year, I think we really see that. And we see that now, especially with all, I know it's a bit of a men mental time, but, um, you know, the, the trees are growing leaves again. It's becoming green. It's becoming, you want to walk out, you want to be outside. And that's that connection to nature again. And I think that's, that's what these stories kind of have at a lot of their heart is like, is more so maybe than other, uh, other cycles. And maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm reaching here, but it feels like the Fina often have an engagement with, their surroundings in in the stories. Hi, Tony. That was a question. <coughs> that's not that's not a question. Who's Tony? Your dad. Your dad. Yeah, yeah. Tony's here. <laughs> hey, Tony. Hey, Tony. One of the greatest stories we know. We know. Our, 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 our father. Our father. Um, I guess that's what I mean. Um, with with the, with going out and and being around being around nature and wanting to feel connected to these stories and like that's why Dermot and Grania was such a nice story to tell because like there's Dermot and Grania beds all over Ireland and it's just they seem to be able to hunt forage live off the land on the run survive somehow in this impossible feat and stay away from the Fianna because Dermot kind of the more I looked into him and I went on this big research kind of looking into Dermot and looking at you know all of the background kind of stories of him, how he got the love spot, how he um, got the the moral took and the biogal took the big spear and, the, and the, the, the two swords he had. He was given by his foster father, uh, his two spears, all all of that kind of stuff to him. But he seems like literally the best of the Fianna, bar none. Like everything about him is just seems to be amazing. So it's interesting that this story he's set as the outcast, and usually and like Hostel the Quicken Tree comes as as a rescue uh, to Fionn McCool and he's I don't know is he the best of the Fianna would you say or one of like he's definitely set up as being one of the best of the Fianna I don't know that uh, it's it's kind of the it's kind of a feature of storytelling though and mythology that like whoever the hero of that particular story is superlative um, so like Fionn is the is the best warrior when it's a Fionn story and it's about Fionn and like, but Dermid, yeah, Dermid is definitely often cast as the great hero. Um, and I think that's the tragedy of Dermid and Gronia is that he's like mm. the best one. And, uh, and yet Fionn can't let go of his jealousy and his, his anger with Dermid. So that's, I guess, <clears throat> we talked a little bit about, about this kind of la last week. We talked a little bit about Grania especially and her difficulty uh, in, in the situation. And, you know, again, to recap very briefly, Grania, high, the high king of Ireland's daughter, was asked to be married by Phil McCool. He, she said yes, kind of unwittingly, agreed to marry this old man as it turned out. And then sees the boy that she actually fell in love with years ago, Dermid, and kind of puts a gash on him to run away with her. And then they basically run away for the rest of, most of the rest of their lives. Until eventually they uh, sue for peace and, and manage to to get some form of forgiveness from Fionn. And 
I guess we talked a bit about that relationship where Grania was in, this whole thing was imposed upon her and how Dermot again I just I don't, one of my difficulties into this story was always and I, I, I think I cracked it w- with discussing it with you but I'd like to share this kind of insight that we kind of found together well I certainly came across me uh, thanks to you and it was I found it really hard to to, 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 to connect with Grania because she just comes across as a pain in the ass in the story and Dermot is so harshly done by and he's brilliant and he's fantastic and, and then this girl comes over to him asks him to run away and he has to and leave all his friends behind and kind of loses basically everything they ever loved and has to go on, on the run with this woman that he kind of eventually ends up kind of falling for it seems but there's another way of looking at that that you kind of alluded to or brought my attention to I think that's that's again a kind of a thing in a lot of these stories like there's the Tristan and Isolde story and the you know there's a there's a number of stories that kind of follow this template and it's the idea that the the falling in love is outside of control and her falling in love Mm. with him is outside of her control it is a thing that happens to her without her wanting it to um which kind of I think in the storytelling is a, is a bit of a device to like absolve her of that guilt uh, so that you can not hate her because <laughs> I think it is like uh, oh Gar says this keeps stopping on me any text suggestions turn it off and turn it on again Gar there you go Gar um, IT crowd will always point you in the right direction uh, hopefully it's not our end. I'm not quite sure. Don't think. I don't uh, think it's our end. I think so. we're okay. Anyway, um, so yeah, I think there's that there's that kind of device built into the story that like this isn't this isn't her fault. This this love is a thing that happens to you. It's a thing that happens outside, and that's like you get that in a lot of mythology. If you think about you know the Greek mythology and the and the Cupid's arrow and and eros and all that kind of stuff for. Love potions are a big feature as well in a lot of stories like this. That like love is not a thing within your control. It happens to you and then you have to make a choice and you have to make some decisions. And her choice is, um, yeah, to basically kind of kidnap the guy. Which is actually what she does. Um, hi, Adam. Essentially, yeah. Um, yeah, like she, like that's what she does. She puts a gash on him to run away with her, which is a, which is a move. Like that's, that's a, that's that's a, like the the whole idea of the gash in Irish mythology, I think as well, is a is an interesting one because it's like, it's an incredibly powerful thing that someone can invoke at any time on anybody. But you are backing up your words with all of the power of fate and destiny in the other world. So it probably wasn't something that people sure. did lightly. Like, you know, I put a guess on you to get me a cup of tea would be like <laughs> an incredibly irresponsible use of that. Because it would be understood that like any time that you weren't able to get me a cup of tea, the entirety of the world and destiny in the other world would fucking crash down on you like a ton of bricks. Um, and yeah, like, is this, is this a case of Dermot getting Stockholm Syndrome, as Oshin suggested in the comments just now? Maybe. Um, because well, she's the only person that yeah. he can talk to now. Because, um, Fionn won't take him back. Uh, Fionn is furious yeah. with him. Fionn won't take him back. And he's stuck in the wilderness with this woman. Um... And, like, that's a... I think that's a potential reading of the story as well, is that, like... He's he's just a guy who gets kidnapped and Stockholm syndrome kicks in at a certain point and then he he's just has to deal with it and it's a huge tragedy. Well, well I think I think like the I think the we talked about the Gesh being a plot device and being a, a way to obviously force an individual to act a certain way and I, and obviously that's the kind of the trope in Irish mythology, but it's used in this one in a way to to show that Dermot has to in some way match Grania's inability to act otherwise you know and 
that that I think is a nice c- counter play and, and they both end up in that position where she can't go on without loving and that's just out of her hands because she saw that love spot it's a magic it's a magic spot he has on his forehead that makes all women fall in love with him how annoying is that Gerda Ferda murder Werda um, you know it's totally Cupid's arrow but also he then in seeing her inability to do anything else but love him falls in love with her because he maybe it's Stockholm syndrome maybe it's that but maybe but it's and again it's it's that it's that point where she challenges his bravery she challenges him saying you can't even look at me as as a woman and in some versions this formorian warrior comes down and picks her up yeah we we told that last time yeah yeah um the formorian warrior picks up and yeah he defends her and she's like well yeah well you fuck you whatever uh you wouldn't see me as a sexual object before this but now you do um and obviously i'm not very happy and, and yet i guess dermot then and that, that's the, the breaking point in this and then from then on out in this story you've you've dermot and Grania on the run together and it's it's kind of beautiful because you have them staying in beds together making making beds for themselves all over ireland and you have uh dermot and Grania kind of bed in every local landscape a uh, storyteller in the local will tell you that hill is a, a dear uh, Grania bed and you have I, I guess the the way dear Max then is all for Grania and even when he goes to the Rome berry tree she won't eat any berries that aren't picked by him which is just I, again it's just showing in the, the lovely subtle nuances in their relationship that it's she's sick and she's heavily in need of these berries and yet she won't eat any that he doesn't pick yeah and yeah yeah you know, you know, and it's and lovely. It's, it's, it's a real kind of vulnerable just, moment. Just, just well, I think I think that's like, I actually think the pregnancy is another like important kind of moment in their relationship because, like, it, it, it. As I imagine, it is with any relationship. It is, but like <laughs> you know, thing, as in as in the mythology, you know, where everything is is kind of exaggerated and externalized. Like, this is. It's it's funny the way myths and storytelling deal with pregnancy because a lot of the time it's just it it's like oh and then there's a baby like it's not even fucking mentioned it's like soap opera time oh she's pregnant now there's a baby and everything else that happened is like woman stuff when we don't look at it um but then there are there this is one you know you you hardly ever hear about morning sickness in mythology and here Grania has this absolutely horrendous pregnancy where she can't eat. And they're on the run. Like, I know friends of mine who've been pregnant and, and talking about the, the level of exhaustion that it causes. Um, and Aaron had to go somewhere. <laughs> um, so... I'm sorry, my cat was meowing to get in. I see, I was wondering. Okay, this is the cat who probably called all the te- caused all the technical difficulties, like... I'm going to blame Gammy. She's no drinking, drinking water. It's <laughs> fine. Blame the cat. Uh, always. So like, yeah, it's it's kind of a funny one because it is, it is a, certainly from what I can think of off the top of my head now, it's a pretty unusual treatment of like pregnancy in a myth, in a myth because she's got this extremely tough pregnancy. But it also, there's something about the power balance shifting as well. Like she has, um, she places the Gesh on him to begin with, which is a way of her taking all of the power. And then he does the counter Gesh, and then they're on a little bit more of an equal footing. But this put this completely lays her low. This puts her completely at his mercy. And like in theory, he could throw her over his shoulder and like take her home. She she can't she can't do anything at that point. Um, she's completely helpless. But he decides instead what? to confront. Um. The she decides uh, like to confront, um, or he decides to confront the the giant of the Rowan tree and yeah, yeah, yeah help her, yeah, yeah. and then you get that lovely scene with um him playing chess. Yeah, that is lovely, um, and I, I I guess from from then on out you kind of see as well like loyalties in the Fianna, Oshin, Oscar, 
Conan Whale even is mentioned as like not really wanting to catch Dermot. They're like, okay, this is bad and, and everything. And like, depending on the versions you read, you, 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 there's different stuff going on there. Um, d- d- like Lady Gregory doesn't actually mention uh, that she gets pregnant until they actually settle down. Well, uh, that's a, that's a have her. proper Victorian lady way of retelling the myth. I always, I always find it funny the things that Lady Gregory puts in and leaves out, particularly when it when it comes to I the know, female yeah. characters. Because <laughs> yeah, it's very know, like. Yeah. And then uh, when they were married and settled down and had a household, babies happened. <laughs> out of the woodwork, <laughs> as they do. Could we have babies on the run? Are they having babies on the run? Certainly can't talk about actually talk about women's problems like one no. could never. Um, you know, and, and yet she's, she's a brilliant, brilliant resource for all of the rest of the details. Oh and yeah, stuff, but like but she just, just really does just some very strange as, topics for sure. As with our retellings, she is and and our take on things. Uh, as much as we are a product of our time, she's a product of hers, and so there are there are sure. really interesting highlights and omissions. Um, so I, I wanna, just need to clarify about basically. Yeah, I just need to clarify one Sorry. thing there. Um. It's fine. Uh, yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, this there's a there's an I know the the audio for Aaron. I, I'm I'm replying to Oshin's question now about tech support. Um, the audio for Aaron is coming through my laptop, so we are getting the audio from Aaron via the speakers of my laptop because otherwise it wasn't working. Um, so that's why he sounds tinnier, and that's why he maybe looks a little bit different because his his all of his stuff is coming through the internet and through the, the thing. So he's kind of like double streamed. So he might sound a little bit glitchier than me. Double streamed. Um, that is why. But no, there's I not actually... Just, but don't worry, we'll be releasing this as a podcast. I'm recording my audio at my end. So the podcast will be available with proper audio. Um, come here, I want to talk to you about Fionn. Because a lot of the Fionn stories, Fionn is the foster father of all these characters or all these heroes. He's... The legend that burns the tumul and the salmon of knowledge. He has the wisdom of this world and the next. He's the legend, Fionn McCool. He's brilliant. He's fantastic. And in this story, he comes across awfully. And so bad. He's just angry. He's an angry old man. And not only that, but then he goes completely against his nature at the very, very end. He seems to hold on to a grudge, not forgive, not overlook any or have any empathy for Dearman in the situation, even though his son seems to, Oshin seems to try and point it out to him a few times. And all the rest of the heroes, as I said, kind of seem to be giving Dearman, when they catch him or catch up with him, a chance to run away if they can, and not really want to go after him. And so then Fionn has this horrible kind of darkness in him that he can't let go. And then at the very end, he seems to go completely against his nature, and even after saying he's forgiven Dermot and Grania, they've settled down somewhere near Belenbulben, presumably out in Sligo, uh, looking at the lovely mountains and, and the coast and all of that beautiful scenery. And they have land there, they're hunting there, and they're settled down. They have a big long feast and celebrate a kind of a, a some form of connection and level ground between the Fianna and Dermot and Grania and their family. And a year and a day later, Fionn goes out hunting. Seems to, in some readings, kind of set Dermot up to come out with him to hunt the terrible boar of Ben Bulbin when he knows Dermot has a gash and him never to pierce the skin of a wild boar and lo and behold Dermot gets gouged by the boar and Fionn goes to him or Dermot sorry Dermot asks him to give him a drink out of, out of his hands to cure him because it's magic and he'll be healed and once and twice he lets it spill on the ground until finally he goes oh god what am I doing picks up the third and pours into an already dead Dermot Divna's mouth that seems to me to go completely against everything we've known about Fionn McCool up to this point character wise it just has a conflict can you give us some insight as to what I think you gotta I think there's there's a, like for me that ending is so poignant because and, and I'm just going to talk about the ending for a minute before I get on to the rest of it I think that ending is so poignant because this is this is an internal war in Fionn McCool that he loses. The better half loses. Where like <clears throat> and I think it's very true of how we forgive people as well. You can you can kind of 
if someone's hurt you and I think Dermid profoundly hurts Fionn and I think this is a side of Fionn that, that Fionn doesn't recognise. I think Fionn's behaviour is very out of character but I also think like all of us have our buttons that when pressed we just are at the mercy of our emotions and Dermid um, pushes one of those buttons in Fionn McCool and he loses his, his self-control and then I think he thinks, you know, in my in my read of that, I think Fionn thinks he has forgiven Dermot. I think he he believes that he has and that everything is OK now and he's been able to put it aside and he's been able to move past it. And then when and I think that happens sometimes as well, where you're like, yeah, I forgive you. And then if you see somebody that has hurt you in the past that you think you've forgiven and you think you're over it but you suddenly have them at your mercy there can be this weird like oh twist the knife like voice that pops up where you're like oh shit I didn't I thought I thought I was done with this I thought this rage was gone but it it, it comes back and like yeah it comes back and I think it comes back on Fionn McCool where he thinks he's he thinks I like that's that to me is a more interesting read of it. Um because <coughs> Sorry, I think he yeah. thinks he's okay it's with very Dermot. Human, anyway. and it's very humanizing and it's very human of Fionn. Like he thinks he's forgiven Dermot. He thinks he's okay with it. He goes to cure him, and at that very last moment, that little voice in the back of his head makes it makes him drop the water twice. And like the third time he wins the internal struggle. He gets past it. He's finally fully forgiven Dermid. And it's too late. And like that's the that's the bit that I think is really kind of that's where I think it's really, really good. And I know you can read it as Fionn setting up the whole hunt in order to to put Dermid in a position where he can he can do this. But I don't I don't think Fionn is ever that Machiavellian. I don't think he's ever that calculating. Uh, like he's very he's he's very wise he's very intelligent um but there's you know there's there's something there's something about like even the best of us and even those of us who really feel that we've like you know got a handle on life and our emotions and and you know have a have a good we're we're pretty pretty okay with most stuff there's often unresolved little things and they rear up in the most destructive ways. And I think like there's something as well about had Fionn had to confront this jealousy as a younger man, maybe he, uh, maybe it would have gone differently. But if you think about Fionn as well, like this is a man who lost Sive. This is a man who... Well, this is what I'm going to say. Um... Was Oshin potentially gone at this stage as well? Like, was I don't think he is. Of he's an emotional. I don't know. There's no mention of him in the story. No, you know? there is. And, and like character wise, and even filling in there, there the gaps. Is. And like, <laughs> like... Oshin is. What's in, that? There, there's loads of mentions of Oshin in the story. Oshin is there at the feast. Oshin is at the house of seven doors. Oshin is asking Fionn no, no, to hear no. Dermot at the I end. Mean, no, 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 no. I mean, at the death story. There's loads of mentions oh, of him. Oh, at the no death. There's no mention of him in the death. I thought he was in the death. At that point. On the, I, not, not, not the versions I read. He's not on the hunt. He's not mentioned. Well, then um, he, probably, he he might be gone un, by the time. Unless you can find find a version you can, please, by all means, do. Uh, but again, that's that's the, the, the way we interpret these stories and the way we interpret Fionn as a figure of being a very human character who can dish out a brilliant advice, amazingly fantastic stuff that all people should live by. And how easy is it to give your friend advice on that thing that they're going through? And then as soon as you're going through something yourself, all of that stuff goes out the window and you're doing the exact same thing that you need advice for. Um, not that everyone goes rad, fad, rad, rad, but uh, I do. Um, but, and, and, that's that's indicative of human nature and how grounded and well off and well kind of thought of we have of Fionn McCool and that's why I don't agree with again the Lady Gregory version of Fionn McCool coming up with 
uh, a kind of a trap for him because I think it's it might it might have been a version, but I just I don't think it really makes sense in to, in terms of the character in terms of that 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 um, archetype of of the father figure who's basically there to to protect people. He hears about the boar and he's called upon and he gathers the Fiona and Fiona and Dermot's there and he calls him. Maybe there's something in the back is thinking mm, this is you know, but like it's not. I don't think it's a conscious plan. Um, and up to the point where he where he definitely has that good versus evil battle internally. Um, so yeah, it's, Celia it's, it's, made um, an interesting comment and said uh, maybe the story was originally told by a woman. That's why so much care to detail. And I actually think that's a, there's a there's a I I would be inclined to say yeah maybe because I think there's an interesting thing and I've talked to you about this before Aaron um, in some of the Irish stories in the way that the male characters are described it's very like female gaze <laughs> like there's this there's a there's a certain kind of way that both Dermot and like say Nisha of the Sons of Ishnock are described that is very much um, I think in, in the recent Reese book Celtic Heritage they, they call it a female ideal of masculine beauty rather than a male ideal of masculine beauty. So, you know, you kind of think of the comic book superheroes with all the muscles versus the, the fact that, um, versus the kind of, the kind of male character that, that women will tend to construct if they're constructing a fantasy man, they're quite different. And we're very used in our culture to seeing the, the male ideal of masculine beauty because we have a much more, much more of our media is controlled by men. Um, so I think there's a very strong case that a lot of the Dermot and Grania, like it's hard with mythology to talk about authorship um, in any sense. But I think definitely it, it, it would seem to me that there are female, there is a female perspective and a female voice uh, running through this story in terms of how Dermot is talked about and in terms of um, how how the pregnancy is dealt with and in terms of a lot of the kind of, yeah, a lot of those details that are kind of maybe left out of different stories. And like also, I think, you know, there's that thing of a lot of powerful uh, men will think, well, my status and my power means that no woman will refuse me. And that's the discussion that the Fianna have at the beginning when they're deciding uh, that Fionn needs a wife. That's what Oshin says to him. It's like no woman would, would reject you because you're the captain of the Fianna. And they find a woman who goes, no, no, I'm sorry, you're old and disgusting. I don't give a shit that you're the captain of the Fianna. Your wealth and power actually doesn't mean anything. Um, which, you know, is kind of yeah. kind of kind of a take. <laughs> which very refreshing to hear. Like, all right, great. You don't have to be rich and powerful. Savage. Yeah, no. <laughs> you, you need, you need to work yeah, on your personality the, uh, instead. Orlando Bloom. <laughs> yeah, like... I think the dear, Orlando Bloom or the, you know, the... Tom Hiddleston in, in, the, in the Marvel that films that point of beauty, yeah. none, of the, none of the people in the studio thought would become a heartthrob because he's the bad guy and he's skinny. And he's put up next to Chris Hemsworth as Thor and a whole load of women were like, oh no, we like that one. Put him in more films. Um, you know, the ways that these yeah, yeah, things yeah. come out. Like Dermot's a pretty boy. Like he's definitely, he's, he's you know, if you, were, if you were casting him, you'd be looking more at like boy band members. Like <laughs> I'm trying to think of a current boy band. I'm oh so God. old. <laughs> don't don't make it sad and feel old. <laughs> just, just don't avoid like, that. I know there was one called One Direction, but I think that um, might be finished now. I don't know. <laughs> I think they're. I think, I think they're, long like, they're going in a different direction now. <laughs> Oops. Hey. Um, <laughs> oh Jesus! Sorry about that. All right. Well, look. I I I, I think that is an interesting uh, point of view as well in terms of like how like how these stories were kept alive and in, in a matriarchal society that not necessarily all again we we have this word druid and now in the same matriarchy a, a, a guy with um i know but I, I'm, I'm thinking of like how when these stories were like and potentially what i'm leaning towards is how in a society that potentially had a lot more powerful women 
Yeah, uh, I think I think more I think more egalitarian. And women. Yeah, I think I think more more egalitarian than matriarchal. Um, But yeah, like we've uh, we've talked about that before as well. That like the word druid, um, you don't necessarily have a word druidess uh, in 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 the the books that we read. So you know you're reading about a druid, and then halfway down the page, there's a pronoun, and it's she. Um, And like the the fact that you know we today would think of druids mostly as being men. because you know there's the, the the kind of Gandalf type because that's all that we've seen um you know when people are putting this stuff we've on film. they were all dudes with beards and gray hair like, yeah they're all of them you don't you don't see the Tolkien. the powerful uh Kaliak. and again Tolkien like a total product of his time went to an old boys boarding school yeah. went to the army there were no women around him and so when he wrote a book, there were no women in his books. Not actually that weird. Um, yeah, he's the culture was stole a lot of names from Irish mythology and ideas. Well, you know, borrowed, creatively. Yeah. Yeah. and a lot of other Colin mythologies. Dave and Claire. And a lot of other yeah. mythologies. Um, he was borrowing yeah. from a lot. Uh, I have no, I have no yeah. quarrel with Tolkien. I think, I think, I think he was, I think he was lovely. <laughs> Perfect. Um, uh, my my last question is so we've we've looked we've kind of we've looked at this story before and we've just released a live uh, podcast or live recording of the story you told in the Sugar Club in February and that is the story of Eptuk the story of Dermot's daughter. Now this story Dermot and Grania, ends and not a lot of people know that they had children and or know a lot about their children. I certainly didn't until. Richard Marsh, another storyteller based in Dublin, uh, brought our attention to it, and it's that it's that little uh, epilogue that we never really find out about, about. And I guess we've really enjoyed going down this road because she's mentioned a couple of times. Ekduk is her name. She's the daughter of Dermot, and she avenges Dermot's death you know, well that's that's it's quite surprising are we not talking about that next week I'm just lining oh. ourselves up for it uh, all, cool. all, all, all I thought you were introducing it as a topic and I was like but that then we will have nothing to talk about next yeah. week I'm a little tired because of gin I know I know I'm setting it up for next week because I guess there was there was but there was four children and uh, there was three sons and, and one daughter we don't hear that much about what happened in terms of the conclusion of that story, there's some versions of it that Fionn... Fionn marries, marries Gronia. And they... Yeah, Fionn and Gronia get married. That's that's the general ending of it. Um, she marries she marries him because, because like he feels so fucking bad about what he did to Dermot that he starts calling around. And they end up falling in love because they have this shared grief that they bond over, which is like... Yeah, I can see it. Um... They end up they end up getting married, um. Uh, but their yeah, daughter that, 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 that one that one escapes me. <laughs> I'm like I I'm, I feel I'm like you have a yeah. huge resistance to Gronia as a character on many levels, which I actually didn't realize until we were doing these post show chats, and I was like, holy shit, you fucking hate her. Yeah. Um. A li- this is no, a little bit like I, I don't hate her. I, I, I certainly <laughs> I found it interesting to kind of come around. No, no, no. But like, I I did have a resistance to her. I did have a resistance to her because she does all this stuff too. Dear, I found in telling this story and and researching enough about her, and I, a lot of the readings just paint her as a very two dimensional character, and that's why I didn't like her. It was it was until we painted her as a fuller, fleshed out character that I actually really began to empathise with her and see the insights to her and, and and see the softness to her and see the the humanity and and i guess that i also had this little bit of a what you married fion after all of this so that's where i ended my uh story i just decided to bookend it with starting with dearman and ending with dearman and that's yeah. my part two dearman granny done with dearman and i did, did, didn't want to lead into as a narrative i just wanted to clip it at dearman no and i think and i think that works solid end point i think that's a solid end point and, and it is kind yeah. of the the epilogue after the fact um, thing of like, yeah. Do you want to? Do you want to introduce the idea that? Because I think it does. Like you know, you could see that as being massively undermining of all of their suffering. That like in the end, she marries him anyway. 
but I don't think that's what's going on. Um, I think this is this is a, a I think this, this is a different marriage that she has with Fionn to the marriage she has with Dermot. And I think she's at a different point in her life. And I think she's also like, you know, she's also experienced some profound loss. Uh, also, her three child, her four children immediately leave Ireland because um, she forgives. Do they the immediately case. leave? They pretty much immediately leave in the in the in the story. So this is an this is an interesting story. We will talk about it more next week. This is a story with a single sure. source because we don't have multiple sources for the story of Eachtok. It is there's one source and it's in English. There's probably lots of sources untranslated in libraries around the world. But uh, there's one source in English. So this is like, we have a poem that Richard Marsh translated in Irish King and Hero Tales. And then we have what you and I have discussed around it and kind of built up into into a narrative um, that is not always fully faithful to that poem, but in broad strokes is. And in that poem, yeah, Creech McRonan tells the story of um, how the children of Dermot and Gronia, led by the daughter, who's the eldest one, uh, leave Ireland after like yeah I mean th- that does explain the heartbreak of Ronnie a little bit better and she's completely isolated completely all alone her you know no one's going near her and Fiona McCool comes around and says you know sorry about that Um, I guess yeah I guess you can see how that might happen a different stage of life a uh, different perspective and all C- those things Celia also you, points out that she would have truly Celia also points out that she would have gone for gone for Fionn. <laughs> I mean, sure. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm glad, glad you would say it. <laughs> uh, I mean, like if if Fionn McCool is, and again, th- that kind of that makes more sense anyway in a character point that Fionn McCool is actually that devastated, that traumatized, and that upset by what he's done. You know, um, I think and, he tries to make it up to her. I think and, I think this is a this is a like there's all kinds of stuff that we haven't really talked about in terms of, you know, um, the hero's journey and uniting with the feminine and all this kind of like uh, subtextual kind of symbolic stuff that's going on in this, in this myth as well. Um, Talk about it. Go for it. I was going to say, because I'm too tired. (laughs) Ah, I see. You're always tired. Wake up out of that. No, I'm not always tired. I'm just tired today. Nothing's working. <laughs> Is that because you've been drinking gin with a little house party of friends of yours last night? Mm. Yes. Is that the reason? Yes. Hungover, I may have Sarah had Day. a G-hang with the G-hang, with the gang. Um, and I may have experimented with some different garnishes for gin and tonic. And then I may have, just maybe, put on my Bluetooth headphones and uh, put on a surprisingly accurate... Uh, Spotify auto-generated uh, mix did a really good job of recreating like uh, gold sounds in Sir Henry's in the late 1990s um, and I may have bopped around in my backyard for a couple of hours Were you wearing a fancy dress? No I was not Oh you didn't have a fancy dress day yesterday but you had a fancy dress day the day before I had a fancy dress day the day before yeah Yes, I mean, yeah. we all got to feel bad. I mean, uh, <laughs> I'm getting through this lockdown my way, but the result is, I just wanted to like mention there's a lot of other stuff going on. There's a lot of other ways you can read this myth. There's a lot of other ways you can interpret this myth. You can go into a full Jungian analysis of like the union of masculine and feminine and maturation and all that kind of stuff. But I don't really have the capacity to do that right now. It's just like you know, if you want to, <laughs> it's the thing you can do. Sure. <laughs> It's a thing. It can be done. It's a thing. It can be done. Um, Well, all right. Listen, guys, we're going to be editing this together and uh, putting up as a post-show podcast uh, on our podcast. If you don't subscribe to our YouTube channel, channel, we will be putting up uh, a lot of our live gigs that we have recorded and other podcasts or content up on YouTube. So subscribe. Subscribe to whatever you get your podcast channel. Subscribe Uh, to our podcast. We're on basically all of them. And give us a like, give us a share uh, if you're feeling it. Uh, thank you very much. This will be going out live and uh, if next Saturday as well. You can. Uh, some of you already are, uh, but if you can, uh, Patreon.com forward slash Candlelit Tales. 
is the website address. You won't find us if you put us, is, us in as a search in Patreon search bar because their search function doesn't show anything that is tagged as over 18s, which we are because sometimes we swear. Um, which but I that just is think how we should totally it. change. Listen, like... We have no control over that. I'm just telling people that it's patreon.com forward slash candlelit tales. And uh, basically we, we set it as uh, there's lots of different tiers of support. But if you put in two dollars a month, you get access to everything because we didn't want to make our rewards tied to income. Because we figure if you can support us, you'll support us by the amount that you can afford to support us by. <laughs> you know, does that make sense? Makes does that make sense, sense as a sentence? Makes I don't know. Um Anyway, if you want, if you can do that, that's there. Yeah. There's also a PayPal button on our website, which is candlelittales.ie. If you want to make like a one-off, one-time donation and just throw some change in the kitty uh, and you don't want to set up like a monthly ongoing thing, uh, that's also there. So that is the stuff. That is, that basically, is basically us. us. Thanks, Thanks very much for tuning in, guys. I'm glad that George, George. was able to um, get his Wi-Fi working and, and uh, reboot it in lower quality. I have seriously low internet reception here as well, um, I, and it's it's quite difficult. So yeah, uh, I appreciate you trying to make the interweb work. Yeah, know that everyone's online these days. It's also, a little bit difficult. Ro, that is a dangerous suggestion, but I will take it under advisement. <laughs> what was the suggestion? I didn't see it. Hair of the dog. <laughs> Yeah, all right. Well, we're going to be taking that under suggestion and um, keep safe, keep isolated and uh, fair play to you all, you lovely creatures. You. Bye. I'm going to press the Bye thing. for now, Bye guys. For now, guys. Bye, guys. Thanks a million.